Let's take a look at the spy plane the CIA wanted built, the A-12 Archangel, which flew higher and faster than anything before it, used some incredible cameras, and how sourcing materials for this airplane was one of the greatest Cold War applications of dummy corporations. The Lockheed A-12 Archangel was a Mach 3 Plus high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft built by the infamous Skunk Works for the Central Intelligence Agency. Based on the designs of Kelly Johnson, the A-12 flew for just five years, from 1963 to 1968, and was the first in a family of super spy planes. Despite its short service life, the A-12 introduced revolutionary concepts in both aviation and manufacturing, and still holds the official world record for the fastest and highest air-breathing aircraft ever to fly, Mach 3.29 at 90,000 feet. Today, we will take a look at how this aircraft came to be and the interesting story behind their procurement of its most essential material. At the height of the Cold War and long before spy satellites, the only way to get intel from deep inside an enemy nation was to overfly their territory and take photos, which would be developed later for analysis. Needless to say, this was incredibly dangerous and the U-2 or Dragon Lady was a purpose-built spy plane for the Central Intelligence Agency. Its mission? To keep track of developments and troop movements deep inside the Soviet Union. The U-2 flew higher than either Soviet fighters or surface-to-air missiles at the time could reach. That is, until 1960, when one was famously shot down over Russia. Two years later, in 1962, another U-2 was shot down over Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This, along with improving Soviet radar technology, created the need for some serious upgrades. And Project Rainbow was conceived. The project was an effort to make the U-2 less detectable by reducing its radar cross-section or RCS. After intensive design and testing sessions, some improvements were indeed made that lowered the U-2's radar cross-section. However, the compromises necessary to do so were too great. The U-2 lost about 20% of its range and 5,000 feet of altitude. Recall that in this era, speed was life and altitude was life insurance. So a loss of 5,000 feet of maximum altitude was too great a price to pay. Following the Project Rainbow efforts, the CIA concluded that a replacement aircraft for the U-2 was needed. Enter Project Gusto, which produced some fascinating design proposals from Convair and Lockheed for a new spy plane. Each manufacturer would take a very different approach to the design challenge. Convair had proposed radically modifying its already fast supersonic B-58A Hustler bomber. The Hustler was designed to fly with a large centerline external payload, and the proposed variant would be known as the B-58B or Super Hustler, and would carry an auxiliary or parasite aircraft on its centerline. The idea was that the Super Hustler would accelerate to Mach 2, where the parasite aircraft's RJ-59 ramjet engines could be started. The parasite aircraft would then be launched at an altitude of 35,000 feet and about 2,300 nautical miles from the intended target. By activating its ramjets after separating from the Super Hustler, speeds of Mach 4 and altitudes of 90,000 feet would be obtained. After a quick dash over the target area, two conventional JT-12 turbojets would be used to fly the aircraft to a friendly base. After several design iterations, the parasite aircraft became known as the First Invisible Super Hustler or FISH. Meanwhile, Lockheed Skunk Works team, led by Kelly Johnson, were working on their own series of designs which were termed Archangel. This codename was given since the U-2 program had been known internally by Lockheed as the Angel. The Archangel designs were successively numbered A-1, A-2, and so on. By the time design A-11 had been reached, the aircraft was to have a speed of Mach 3.2, attain altitudes of 90,000 feet, and have a range of 3,200 miles. The A-11 design was submitted for review, however, due to its relatively large RCS, the A-11 design was rejected. As a result, Lockheed was asked to lower the RCS of the A-11, and Convair was tasked with designing a twin-engine aircraft that would have similar performance to the A-11. Interestingly, for this second round of design proposals, both Lockheed and Convair turned to the Pratt & Whitney J-58 as their engine of choice. The J-58 was originally delivered for the Martin P-6M Seamaster a strategic bomber flying boat which itself was a fascinating aircraft and concept. However, when the Seamaster program was cancelled, Lockheed and Convair swept in and selected the J-58 for their purposes. The reason for this was simple. The J-58 was the most powerful engine available and had a unique ability. It was essentially a turbo ramjet, meaning it could operate as a conventional afterburning turbojet from takeoff up to Mach 2 and then 
by using a permanent compressor bleed to the afterburner at speeds over Mach 2, act like a high-speed ramjet, an incredible design feature for its time. As a result, Convair came up with the all-new Kingfish design, while Lockheed produced the A-12. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see a separate video all about the Kingfish. Getting back to the competition, although the Kingfish had a theoretically lower RCS, in the end, the A-12 was selected for several reasons. Convair's development of the B-58 had proved both lengthy and costly, and there were fears that this would occur once again had the Kingfish been allowed to go into production. While Lockheed had produced the U-2 on time and under budget, because of this, the CIA went with the A-12 project, which took on the codename Oxcart. The thinking probably was that no one would imagine something named Oxcart would actually be the fastest airplane ever to fly at the time. With the RCS reduction problem solved, the next challenge was performance. The Oxcart aircraft was required to achieve speeds of Mach 3.2, making it faster than a rifle bullet, have a range of over 4,000 nautical miles, and reach altitudes of up to 97,500 feet. Essentially, with these requirements, the Oxcart aircraft would have to be five times faster and fly three times higher than its predecessor, the U-2. To achieve these incredible performance figures, the A-12 would have to use hard-to-find materials and in many cases invent new ones. Perhaps the biggest challenge to be overcome was the actual skin of the airplane. At altitude and speed, sections of the A-12 skin could reach 900 degrees Fahrenheit or 482 Celsius. At these temperatures, aluminum would simply melt, and while stainless steel would have worked, the weight penalty was prohibitive. Weight in aircraft is everything. Case in point, to reach the extreme altitudes it was intended to fly, it was determined that each pound saved added a foot of altitude. After investigating many materials, Johnson settled on a titanium alloy known as B120. B120 was the strongest stainless steel, but half the weight. There were two major problems with B120. First, titanium was incredibly expensive, and secondly, during the 1960s, there were no suppliers in the United States that could deliver the amount necessary to produce an entire aircraft, let alone several examples. As a result, in one of the more fascinating Cold War developments, the CIA created various back channels and dummy corporations to purchase large amounts of titanium from the world's leading exporter at the time, the Soviet Union. Allegedly, the cover story for these shell companies was that the titanium was needed for pizza ovens. As a result, the CIA figured out how to purchase large amounts of titanium for pizza ovens from the Soviets and then built an aircraft to spy on them with it. And while titanium could handle the intense heat generated at altitude and speed, it did introduce its own set of problems. As the titanium used in the airframe heated up, it would expand. As a result, Lockheed engineers had to design gaps or expansion joints in the seams of the skin of the aircraft. Normally, gap sealing materials would be used to keep the fuel from leaking out of the airplane while on the ground. However, a sealant that would not dissolve into the fuel system was never found, so the A-12 was typically only provided enough fuel to reach a tanker, top off, and climb to its operating environment, at which point the metal would heat up and close the gaps. In other words, every time you put fuel in the A-12 on the ground, it would leak. And finally, in another weight-saving measure, the A-12 had no means of starting itself. To get the engines turning, the AG-330 start cart was developed. The AG-330 was named the Buick as it was powered by two Buick V8 Wildcat engines coupled together. Technicians say it sounded like a stock car race in the hangar whenever the A-12 was started up. The A-12 was finally ready for flight testing. Initial flights of the A-12 were done with J-75 engines, and eventually the more powerful J-58 engines were installed. However, once flights with the J-58s began, problems were encountered at speeds between Mach 2.4 and 2.8. Essentially, the aircraft's own shockwave would interfere with airflow into the engine. The solution was to redesign the cone-shaped air inlets and allow them to move forwards or backwards as much as three feet to control airflow into the engine. Having a super fast, high-flying spy plane didn't mean much unless you had materials to gather intelligence with. For the A-12, this was in the form of cameras. During its career, the A-12 implemented three camera systems which made use of photographic innovations never before seen in imaging. The first camera system was the Perkin Elmer Type 1, which was a high ground resolution stereo camera that used an 18 inch lens with 6.6 .6 inch film. Each image covered a 71 mile wide swath of land with a ground resolution of 12 inches. To capture this large area, a 5,000 foot long roll of film was used. The second camera system was the Eastman Kodak Type 2, another stereo camera system which used a 21 inch lens and 8 inch film. This camera covered a 60 mile swath of land with a ground resolution of 17 inches. 
This system used an 8,400 foot long roll of film. The third camera system was known as the Type 4 and was made by Hikon and designed by James Baker. The Type 4 was a spotting camera with an extremely high ground resolution. Using a 48 inch lens on 9.5 inch film, a 41 mile swath of land with a ground resolution of 8 inches was captured. To accomplish this, the Type 4 carried 12,000 feet of film. Along with the cameras, a unique type of camera window was designed in order to produce these high resolution images. Again, with the high speeds and temperatures the A12 would operate in, conventional glass would not work. A completely distortion free window had to be designed, which would be able to withstand an exterior temperature of 550 degrees, along with 150 degree internal temperature to protect the cameras. An ingenious solution was designed by the Corning Glassworks, which produced a quartz glass window that was fused to the metal frame. Incredibly, fusing the quartz window to the metal frame involved an unprecedented process which used sound waves. And finally, later in the A12 program, Texas Instruments developed an infrared camera known as the FFD4, which used 3.5 inch film with a 150 foot supply. The infrared camera had a day or night resolution of 60 feet, along with tolerances of 3 degrees thermally and 1 milliradian spatially. Following its brief operational career, the final A-12 flight was made by Frank Murray on June 21, 1968 to the Palmdale, California storage facility, where all the remaining A-12s were placed in storage for over 20 years. And while the A-12 did have a short operational run, it did lead to the YF-12, M-21 and more famous SR-71, which will be the subject of their own upcoming videos. The term revolutionary sometimes gets overused in aviation, but the A-12 most certainly was. Kelly Johnson used to say, beautiful planes fly beautifully, and that was most definitely true of the A-12. Built to eclipse its predecessor, the U-2, the A-12 flew higher and faster than anything before it. If you enjoy ultra-fast airplanes from yesteryear, then click or tap on this icon to check out the video on the XB-70 Valkyrie, the Mach 3 bomber that gave the Soviets nightmares. Now you know!